Hello and welcome to the second of my historical movie analysis videos tackling the subject of how history is used in popular movies and TV. My first was on Westworld, uh, the popular HBO show. Uh, this time we're going to go a little bit further back. Uh, recently I watched, uh, rewatched Bernardo Bertolucci's epic The Last Emperor which is about uh, Puyi, the final Chinese emperor who was overthrown in 1912. Uh, this is a very famous film, uh, came out in uh, 1987, won nine Academy Awards, including Best Picture. Um, I saw it when it came out, and this film, uh, in a way, sort of, sort of changed my life. It kind of fuels my interest in China. I studied, as an undergraduate, I studied Chinese history. I was an Asian studies minor. Um, and largely my interest in China was sparked by this film. Uh, but how accurate is it really? Well, uh, for what they show, it's actually fairly accurate. Uh, but the, uh, the catch is that they leave a lot of stuff out and the omissions themselves kind of distort the story of the last emperor. Um, one thing, you can't separate the film from how it was made. It was the first Western feature to be able to film in the Forbidden City, the, which was the uh, traditional palace of the Chinese emperors. Um, and this was one of the first Western films, period, that was filmed in People's Republic of China. Uh, China had opened up uh, to Western filmmakers, and there was kind of a, a, a sort of a mini film boom of Western productions being made in China at this time, 1986. That year, Steven Spielberg's film Empire of the Sun was filming in, at exactly the same time in Shanghai. So a lot of films were being made in China. Uh, to make use of this location, the Forbidden City, which is a spectacularly visual location, uh, naturally the film is skewed heavily toward depicting uh, Puyi's youth and childhood, which was spent in the Forbidden City. Um, and then it kind of skims over the rest of his life, basically. Um, dwelling mostly on his uh, time as the figurehead emperor of Manchu Kuo, which was a puppet state set up by the Japanese. The film's based very heavily on Puyi's autobiography and also a book which is referenced in the movie itself called Twilight in the Forbidden City by Reginald Fleming Johnston. Uh, Johnston, of course, is the Peter O'Toole character in the film. He was Puyi's tutor. I've actually, I have not read Puyi's autobiography, but I have read Twilight in the Forbidden City. Um, basically, the late Qing system, this is the Qing dynasty, the uh, also known kind of in archaic terms as the Manchu dynasty. Uh, this imperial system was totally out of step with the modern world. And it was kept deliberately that way, mainly by uh, Cixi, who was the Empress Dowager. She appears in the film uh, in probably its most unrealistic scene. Uh, she happens to die just minutes after she's introduced to Puyi, who was only three. So that touch is a little over dramatic. Um, Empress Dowager is actually uh, Cixi. Her life is a really fascinating story. She was a courtesan who was first brought to the palace in the 1850s, I believe, or 1860s, and she manipulated the power behind the throne. Um, Puyi's predecessor, who was called the Guangzhou Emperor, tried to rule in his own right, but uh, the Empress Dowager put the kibosh on that. She led a palace coup, which put him under house arrest, essentially for the rest of his life. And when it looked like she was about to die, she conveniently had him poisoned, and uh, he died at the same time. This is, in fact, referenced in the film. Uh, she chose Puyi as the emperor. Uh, the Gongzhou emperor did not have a direct um, heir. She chose Puyi, uh, just a child, a toddler, in fear that the emperor that came after her would in initiate reforms, and she hated the idea of reform more than anything else. This was, again, in 1908, and this is where the film opens, basically. Well, there's a frame story, but then the film really opens substantively in 1908. The film shows Forbidden City as kind of a ghost ship, uh, an expensive bureaucracy with no one really in charge. Doesn't, uh, it doesn't, interestingly, even dwell on Puyi's abdication in 1912 
uh, when the dynasty was overthrown, the Republic of China did continue to allow the imperial household to remain in the Forbidden City, in a part of the Forbidden City. It took over part of it, um, but not all of it. Um, what the movie does not go into, in interestingly, is that in July of 1917, the monarchy was briefly restored. This was done by a warlord called Zhang Jun. Basically, China had splintered into an anarchic society with warlords vying with each other for power. This restoration did not take. It lasted only a week. Uh, and the movie just, just totally goes, uh, does not even touch that. Uh, I think the movie does depict accurately Puyi's kind of twisted childhood, but it doesn't really get into exactly how warped he was. Uh, Puyi had no moral constraints whatsoever. He would have servants beaten just for the hell of it. Uh, these were mostly eunuchs who were the uh, courtiers who were castrated. Uh, these men served at court. This was a long tradition in Imperial China. So the movie is accurate, I think, in that because no one really brought him up, Puyi could not do very, very simple things. He didn't know how to tie his own shoes. The movie shows us that. He couldn't use a toothbrush properly. Uh, he was this weird, pampered kid that nobody really cared about for his own sake. They took him away from his mother. He was somewhat close to his brother, which is shown in the film. Uh, but the movie does, I think, get that emotional dynamic correct. Probably my biggest beef with the movie is that it tries it tr tries pretty hard to make Puyi into a sympathetic character. Uh, it shows him, uh, played brilliantly by John Lone as an adult, shows him as kind of this innocent waif uh, who's never really had a normal life. Um, actually, Puyi was kind of a monster. Uh, I, I already mentioned uh, that he had servants beaten frequently. He would beat his wives. Um, there was some evidence that he was a sadist. Certainly, he supported Japanese abuses before and during World War II. Uh, the second half of the film, The Last Emperor, uh, really centers on exactly how complicit he was in these abuses in Asia. Uh, Puyi wrote his autobiography, one of the source texts of the movie, remember, to kind of exonerate himself to the extent possible. Um, but uh, natu so naturally he downplays his involvement with the Japanese. He made in his autobiography the incredible claim, which is in fact debunked in the movie, that he was kidnapped by the Japanese in 1931, taken to Manchukuo against his will. That is not true. The Japanese took over Manchuria, which is northeast China, in 1931, really in some ways the beginning of what we call the Pacific War. Puyi was deeply involved in plans to remake Manchuria almost as a province of Japan. It was a puppet state, and uh, this is all sort of paraphrased in the movie, but the general gist is, is pretty accurate. He did become emperor of Manchukuo in 1934. Basically, the state uh, was all for show. It was, um, and the movie, especially the director's cut of the movie, goes into how the cabinet, for example, was stocked with lackeys of, uh, who worked for the Japanese, especially in the opium trade. The Japanese got millions of Chinese in Manchukuo hooked on opium uh, because it was an easy source of cash. That's accurate. Some major things that the movie leaves out. Uh, Puyi's wives. The film makes you think that he had two wives. There were only two. In fact, he was married five times counting that uh, secondary consort thing that uh, they go into. His fourth wife, uh, a woman called Li, Juku, Li Yujin, sorry, she married him in 1943 um, when he was emperor of Manchukuo. Uh, he was 37, she was 15. Uh, he was select she was selected in a, a photo bride show, uh, and in, in fact, she dished to a newspaper in 1997, only a few years before her death. Really fascinating story, and I'm going to put the link to that story in the, uh, com in the, uh, the information to this video. Second big thing the film kind of glosses over is his, is his sexuality. Now, sources conflict on this. The movie obliquely suggests that he's gay. Uh, Bertolucci's forte as a director is showing sensuality on screen. He's most famous for the film uh, Last Tango in Paris, which is recently in the news. 
Um, there's suggestive scenes in this film with the eunuchs, like there's the whole scene where they're playing with the sheet. Uh, it's not directly erotic, but it's very suggestive. Um, and uh, Puyi is also shown playing sexually with his first two wives. Uh, so he may have been bisexual. Uh, people close, some people close to the real Puyi insist that he was gay and he had a male concubine, while other sources dispute that. Um, another theory is that he simply just didn't really have much sexual function at all. Uh, this is the story that Li Yujin tells us in that article from 1997. She claims that Puyi had sex twice in his entire life, one time with her in the 1950s. Is that true? Who knows? I don't know how she could know that, but, you know, who knows? Maybe she did. I wasn't married to him. She was. Uh, but clearly he did not have children. He may have been impotent. The jury is out, basically, on this aspect of his life. Uh, and the film handles this ambiguity probably about as as well as it can. Uh, the third thing the movie glosses over, uh, Puyi spent five years in prison in the Soviet Union. The film shows us his capture by Russian troops in 1945 who invaded Manchuria after the United States dropped the atom bomb on Hiroshima. Mainly they did this, the Russians did this to grab territory before the music stopped. They knew the war was going to be over soon and they wanted to get on a board in China before that happened. Uh, FDR at Yalta thought that he needed Stalin's help to conquer Japan. That turned out not to be the case and was a major problem for American foreign policy. But anyway, I digress. The commies basically, they captured Puyi, they kept him on ice for five years in Siberia. And then when Mao came to power, they shipped him back to China. Ten more years in prison, then he's released, he became a good communist. Uh, he did not die in the palace. The film doesn't show us that, but it suggests it. Um, so far as we know, he never set foot again in the Forbidden City after 1924 when he and his family were expelled from it. Probably he would not want to. Uh, and in fact, he died of kidney cancer in 1967. So my wrap up, good movie, actually excellent movie, uh, brilliant visuals. Uh, wonderfully acted, particularly not just by John Lone, but I believe the actor who plays Puyi as a teenager, and I don't know his name, um, he is especially good. Uh, so really great, very well made film, and about as accurate as historical biopics get. Not accurate across the board, but it's, re it's a reasonable approximation of the real history. So that's my uh, take on The Last Emperor, and... Uh, I'll be back again with another historical movie analysis. Thanks.